What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Kevin Hundle, and we're going to go through, Kevin, exactly what you do. He's run successful businesses. He does EOS implementation for businesses. Um, And so we're going to get deep into that. And before I formally introduce you, Kevin, I like to always point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And since we're going to be talking all things EOS, I think, um, People can check out the interview I did with Gino Wickman. It was really good. Um, he wrote Traction. That was a really good episode. Mark Winters, who authored Rocket Fuel, um, who co-authored that with Gino Wickman. That's a good episode. Also, Kevin has been the EOS or in the uh, EO sphere for a long time, over almost over 15 years. And um, so we've had some awesome EO people on. Uh, Ethan King, co-founder of Zeus Closet. Robert Hartline, founder of Call Proof. And also just a big thank you to Tom uh, Vranis, who we would not be on this call. Uh, maybe we would, because we've actually met in different circles, but he really uh, introduced us to make sure that this happened and you shared your your expertise on here. So um, we'll talk about that too. But before I formally introduce Kevin, uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. So, Kevin, we kind of call ourselves the magic elves that are running in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company. Um, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and share what they're working on. And I saw actually Kevin speak. At like a YPO EO event, um, Kevin and and then Tom introduced us. I'm like, yeah. done deal. He's amazing, you know. Yeah. So if you can have him speak to your group, ask him. You know, he just delivers so much value. So um, without further ado, Kevin Hundle is an entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience building, scaling, pivoting multiple companies, and since 2009, Kevin's been using EOS in his various companies, which has given him really valuable insights into both the benefits of running a business on EOS and the challenges of running one without EOS. And Kevin helps his clients achieve their goals by fostering a culture of collaboration and growth and ultimately creating kind of a unified team where each team member can contribute in a meaningful way. And he's going to dig deeper into that um, and helping them break through ceilings and increase collaboration. Um, so Kevin, thanks for joining me. Yeah, Jeremy, I appreciate it. And thank you for having me. You know, I, number one is I uh, always have been inspired by podcasts and folks running podcasts. When I came across your business, like you mentioned, we've met several times, but didn't really know what you did until Tom introduced us. And I jumped in and saw the site and I was truly inspired by that gift of allowing people to tell their story. So thank you for having me on here today. I really appreciate that from my heart. Um, I'll kind of go back to my journey and kind of how I got to where I am today. Naturally, a common playground for both of us is EO, which is Entrepreneurs Organization of Chicago. And I actually joined that organization in 2007 uh, through the program called Accelerator, which Accelerator is essentially the feeder program that allows you to get the tools you need and the network and the connections you need to scale your business to a million dollars to join EO. Um, so that's kind of where my journey with EO started in 2009. I remember joining the organization. I was blown away by the intelligence, by the open mindedness of people and the willingness to help one another. And, you know, I'm, I was pulling my hair out, trying to figure out my business. I was about five years into uh, my uh, uh, manufacturing distribution company, Atrend, at that time, and not knowing what to do, right? Uh, cash flow was a problem. You know, it felt like we were being choked because there's no oxygen because of that profitability was an issue. And it was just chaotic. And I'm I'm saying this to an EO member and they go, hey, uh, have you heard of Gino Wickman before? I'm like, no, I know. Who's Gino Wickman? They're like, oh, he's an EO member in Detroit. And uh, he wrote this book called Traction, dude. I think you should read it. And he handed me the book. Uh, a friend of mine at that time, I read the book. I ate it up. I just fell in love with it. 
And really that was the evolution of what has brought me to where I'm at today and really allowed me to kind of scale my business, grow my business, which is also a family business, the manufacturing distribution company, um, and get really healthy in what we were trying to do. And due to that, I became an EOS implementer, right? So there's this whole journey of how that came to life. But really, it's uh, EO that gave me that gift, which which is, you know, as you and I have intersecting paths here, as I think back on it, that's where it all started for me. Talk about, you know, we can kind of talk about this parallel journey, your EOS journey and your entrepreneur journey. Um, talk a little bit about you implementing EOS into your manufacturing business. And we can you know, walk through some of the challenges you had of the implementing and, and some of the high points too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, what it would seem to be always was, is that we were having to work so hard to get the results that we needed in our business. So it's like, we we're working 10 times harder than we needed. And I felt that, and I knew it and you had concepts, right? It's kind of like, you go to an EO event, you'd hear some speakers speak and you come back with all these tools and you throw them on the table and your team be like, okay, what is all this about now? It's like, what's the next flavor of the month Kevin's going to bring after an EO event? You probably know some of those feelings, right? We, we hear these great stories from these inspirational people. And I kept doing that. But what kept happening is we'd bring something in, it wouldn't stick, it would die off. And then I'd go to another EO event, I'd bring something else, it, it wouldn't stick and it would die off. And EO, when I read uh, sorry, EOS, when I read the book Traction, I was like, wow, this is a system. Like, this is what I've needed, like an operating system on my computer. We need a system to run and manage our business. And at that time, as I mentioned, uh, you know, my brothers who now run the company were in the company with me and it was just uh, defragmented, right? We were doing so much, uh, not getting the results that we needed. And EOS and reading Traction really brought three things to life for me, which you know, we call vision, traction, and healthy. Vision number one, we were able to get all the human energy driving in the same direction, which we never did, right? The vision was in my head and in the other folks and leadership teams had, they had their own eyes on the vision. It looked different than mine and theirs. And we had to get connected to really get on the same page. I kind of use the analogy of like, if you're on a canoe, there's one canoe going left, there's one going around, the other one's like tipped over and like screaming for help. That was kind of us because we didn't have a clear vision, but Reading Traction allowed us to get a vision on paper in a simplified way, which then allowed us to gain traction, right? And Traction was all about actually setting up priorities and goals, setting disciplines and accountability to ensure that we would execute on those goals and then celebrating the successes that we had. So we were able to bring traction in and then healthy, uh, which was really about getting a culture that's collaborative that people love to come to the office and they enjoy the work that we, we do together. And I, you know, all bringing all three of those together allowed us to implement the system of EOS. And in that journey, uh, you know, in EOS, we call it the accountability chart, which you can consider as the org chart on steroids, right? It's an accountability chart that's internal for an organization. We're all wearing multiple hats. And one of the first things that we were able to do as we brought the system into the business is get really clear on our accountability chart and who was responsible for what, right? As you can imagine, uh, business is hard enough, yet alone family businesses even actually present more dynamics of, you know, the emotion and the relationship factor that comes in, but piercing through who was responsible for what and getting each of us in our unique ability was just a gift for everyone. Cause we could actually take a sigh of relief and say, wow, I'm doing the things I love to do. I'm great at, and now I can maximize on it. And, so we self-implemented EOS in our business. We brought in an implementer in 2015 that helped us. And what I recognized there was it's hard to be in a system and see the system clearly, right? EOS talks about this concept of we're in the system. We're very emotional and bound by our businesses. It's hard to see it until you bring an outside person in that helps you kind of clarify things. And that was really the, the start of our journey, which allowed me to essentially now uh, exit the business and. Uh, really solely focus on my U.S. practice. What were some of the challenges you faced self-implementing? Obviously, eventually you brought in someone in 2015. Um, I'd love to hear about some challenges, but also what made you decide to bring someone else in, right? Because you'd yeah. probably been self-implementing for a while. Yeah, we were self-implementing for about five and a half, six years. Um, and it's just like, you know, I liken it to being on the front stage of the opera, right? Like you're on the front stage in front of the curtain 
we just see the front stage and what's going on, but we don't know all the stuff that's going on behind the stage simultaneously at the same time. And, you know, getting into the books and understanding, and we are able to get, I would say about 35 or 40% strong in the six key components of EOS. And you would read blogs and talk to others. And it was like, all right, well, you can be 35 or 40% strong, but to really get 80% or 100% strong in the six key components, you need a professional who has actually the toolbox behind the curtain to open up that for you. And our struggles with it was, is number one, you know, we only, we self-taught the tools to ourselves. So we only knew what we knew from reading the books and reading blogs. So number one is we never knew the depth of what the tool can give us. Number two was it's accountability, right? Things get busy, uh, meetings get canceled, things get changed. And it's no different than having a trainer with the gym, right? You got to show up on time. You got to do the reps. You got to be there every week. There's nothing like work. external accountability. Yeah. So the external accountability with a uh, implementer coming in, I think it changes, uh, changed the mindset, right? The minute we had to write a check to get somebody to hold us accountable, it's like, all right, we got to show up now. Um, so I think those are two big things for us, right? It just allowed the onus to get removed off of me and uh, be a contributor in the system as opposed to a person trying to run it, coach it, facilitate it for my team. Yeah, I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about the six key components. I do want to give a shout out to Rafi Arbel, who is uh, also an EO, um, a market JD. You talk about accountability. I was like wanting to work out yesterday and I was like, I think I'm going to fall off the wagon. So I called Rafi. I'm like, do you want to work out with me? He's like, sure. I probably, yeah. he doesn't know like this, but um, I probably wouldn't have worked. Out. I'm like, I, I just need you there. Plus it was fun to do with yeah. someone else, but so um, he helped hold, hold me accountable to working out yesterday, but uh, he All was right. market JD for to guys, helps lawyers. So you guys hit the gym together or what was the workout? Exactly. We, we just did a, you know, like a circuit training of five different cool. exercises and sweat a little bit and talk business a little bit. So um, yeah. it was great. Rafi's a, Rafi's a great guy, and uh, and as I've got to know him, actually, much more the last six months than any time he was in EOI. I don't even know how long he's been there. The last six months, we've crossed pads quite a bit and really a insightful and fun, fun, fun person. Totally. So the six key components of EOS, just for people, just give them a, a little crash course. Yeah, so, you know, the thought uh, in Gino Wickman's book, right, and Gino came up with the, the the whole traction concept and the operating system, it's really that every business is really, you know, circulated around these six key components, right? And the components are, number one, the vision component, which is about uh, getting everyone rowing in the same direction, right? What's our simple strategic plan, getting everybody rowing in the same direction? The second is people. And in the people component is really understanding what right people look like for our organizations, because every organization is different, and then understanding how to get them in the right seat, right? Kind of to our previous conversation of how do we get folks into their unique ability, right? So that's the people component, which is number two. The third is the data component. And the data component is all about, you know, running a business on numbers. I always say to teams I work with, like, you know, we weren't, we weren't born to be great managers. Like, none of us were born to be great managers because we have emotions. We're human right? How do we run a business just with data and numbers? And that's all about the scorecard and the data component. And the fourth is the issues component, which is probably, you know, one of the ones that's the most impactful when you're able to create a culture around people raising their hands and calling out issues and calling out opportunities and collaborating and prioritizing those issues to make them go away forever, right? So if you think about it, Jeremy, it's, you know, you can't achieve your vision without really identifying and solving your issues, right? And that's in direct correlation of your ability to outdo your competition. So it's really, how do we set the same right issues up and how do we solve them? And that's the fourth key component. And the fifth is our process component. How do we build our franchisable model so we can do things consistently in an effective manner, day in, day out, quarter in, quarter out, right? And the last is traction component. And here on the screen, as you've got it, we say traction without, you know, vision without traction is hallucination, right? Because you can have the vision, but if you don't have that sixth key component, which is all about the accountabilities and the discipline, it's no good than just being on the whiteboard, right? So the thought is, how do you strengthen these six key components uh, through the tools of EOS? 
Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for walking through this. If you're watch, listening to the audio, you'll be able to see, you can go to, to learn more about Kevin also, eosworldwide.com slash Kevin dash Hundle. And we'll, you'll be able to see it and look through Kevin's background and some of the things he's talking about. And, um, you know, I guess we could talk a little bit. I want to talk about the family business, you know, uh, piece because you've helped other family businesses as well. Um, but so like putting this into action, um, with the EOS model, the next part is the process, right? And so <clears throat> with you, how do people start? They're like, you know, this sounds great. Maybe they've been self family Maybe they've heard it's good. Maybe they are not doing anything and they want to professionalize it, like you said. How does it work? Yeah. So, you know, the, the EOS has its proven process, which has been tested, right? And, and there's 20,000 plus companies running on the system. And through this uh, this the system and understanding as Gino built it, the way to actually bring it to teams and companies, uh, it was developed as the EOS process, which is essentially an organization that, you know, I, I think it's important to understand what type of organizations fit for the system as well, right? Organizations that are between five and uh, 250 employees that are open-minded, that are not afraid of change, that uh, want to challenge the status quo, that are vulnerable, they're actually target market, they're entrepreneurial firms, right? That really want to grow and scale. Uh, really the first step is something we call the 90 minute meeting. And it's so interesting because a 90 minute meeting, sometimes it's 90 minutes. It's the first time a team actually sits down and reflects on where they're at as a business. So in 90 minutes, we go through about four things. Number one, we tell the organization, the leadership team about us and about the system, about myself, learn a little bit about the business. And it's interesting because we ask specific questions around the room. How clear are we on the vision of the business? And you get scores and ratings and you get to see the, you know, the different variability and, you know, how successful are our internal meetings? And you get to see the variability and see the eyes start opening up with people saying, wow, you know, we have opportunity here. Um, and in that 90 minute meeting, then we actually walk through the tools of EOS and what the actual process is when you implement it, right? So in that 90 minute meeting is kind of the introduction, if you will, where we open up the fire holes on EOS and get organizations to understand what the system is. From there, teams get to go back and discuss, right? And collaborate and get the buy-in if this is really something they wanna do. And if it is, then essentially we are on what we call a two-year journey uh, with our clients in the system, right? And over that two-year journey, essentially as a uh, implementer, you're with the client um, for about, 11 full days over two years working the system. Can you talk about some of the breakthroughs you've seen in some of the 90 minute meetings? Cause you mentioned just in the 90 minute meeting piece, you mentioned, and this is something I think anyone could go back to their team and, and maybe do this experiment and say, ask the different team members on a team meeting. What's, what's the vision and hear what people have to say. What are some breakthroughs you've seen in just that 90 minute initial meeting? Yeah. You know, um, like I said, is it's, it's, Really interesting is in the 90 minute meeting, sometimes that's the first time that the team has sat down around a table and actually collaboratively discuss things, right? Because as we know, business is complex. There's a lot going on and leadership team members and the managers of organizations, they're just working, doing the work, doing the work. So actually, I think the first breakthrough is a sigh of relief, like, oh, let's sit down and actually we can have a collaborative conversation around the business. And so I think that's number one is just the emotional element of it to say we can sigh, take a sigh of relief and breathe a little bit and have a conversation as a team. You know, the real other big one is where you get to see the disparity in which, you know, maybe one person on a leadership team sees where we're going as a business versus another person and where we're going and where that is the, you know, uh, byproduct of us having to do more work and get less results, right? As opposed to managing human energy. And I've had some breakthroughs in the room where it's, People on the leadership team saying, well, I didn't know that's actually what the goal of the business is. I thought it was this, right? And you're like, okay, well, let's talk about the goal, right? And what do we really want to get out of the business? Because these are some natural conversations that take place. Um, you also see really where uh, you have typically visionary in a business, right? They're the founder, they're the thought leader, they're managing the big relationship. There's got a ton of ideas and they're moving 100 miles an hour where you get the other folks in the room who get to understand and see the system. And they're like, oh, thank you. Yeah, we need this, right? We we want this. Like, how do we get this in? How do we get this discipline, accountability, and how do we get this system in our business? Because albeit our leader and our visionary is magnificent, they always are, 
there usually is an organized way to bring the ideas and thoughts into the business to execute the plan. So you get several breakthroughs there. Sometimes it's a big hug from someone just saying, wow, like, how do we, we need this, right? We've been craving this. Help us get this, this uh, accountability and structure in our business. I want to get into the, um, how you've helped your business also, how you've helped other businesses that are family run uh, businesses as well. But how does the the pricing work for the the ninety minute um, that initial ninety minute meeting? Yeah, so the the ninety minute meeting is no cost. It's um, you know us as implementers donating our time or me donating our time to the clients. And I always tell people who are interested in the system, I say just do the ninety minute because you're going to get free tools out of that ninety minute meeting that you can go self implement right, and you can get gains in your business tomorrow. Um, and hopefully you buy me a beer at the end of it, right? And that's usually the thought of it. So the 90 minute really doesn't cost anything. It's more about sharing the gift of EOS with people. Love it. So you help the multi-generational business. Yeah. Talk about that and what you did. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of my clients, multi-generational business with three different generations involved in what they deemed as the leadership team, which is a natural phenomenon, right? I I came through a family business and it's like my little brother joined the company. Of course, he's going to have a seat on the leadership team, right? He shares the same last name as me. Why not? Right. Let's 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 maximize his unique ability by his last name. And that's a natural phenomenon of family business. And in this case, uh, we had a husband and wife partnership, right, uh, running the business and uh, uh, three siblings and then grandchildren in the business as well. So you had about six people who were family on the leadership team, and you had four folks who are non-family on what they deemed as a leadership team. And, you know, they're the, the, the beauty for me and what filled my heart through the journey of EOS with that specific team was not only was there dysfunction in the organization, but there's dysfunction in the family relationship because of the organization. And I know that firsthand, right? I, I uh, had many of nights losing sleep because of dysfunctions of my brothers because of my business until we figured it out through EOS. But in this specific example, you, you could see the friction. You could see everything brewing. And it was it was like- There's a, a lot of history and there's a lot of baggage there. A lot of baggage, a lot of history, a lot of uncertainty of what is this business going to do? Who's getting what? Are we selling it? Is it going to be a legacy? Are we going to continue with it? And really that disconnect was showing up in just the way they communicated with one another. And- you know, being a family person, I just kind of cut right through and I said, hey, it just feels like we just got all this stuff happening here. What is going to be the best for all of us in the room? Let's open it up and let's talk about it. And, you know, the system, the way it's designed, what Gino was a, a genius at doing was the first thing you do is you build the accountability chart and you work through who is on the leadership team and more than who's on it, what's the right structure for us as an organization, putting names aside. So it's kind of like when we went through that exercise that day and I knew I was entering the danger and I was ready for the danger because, you know, I thrive on that because that's where breakthroughs happen is I was like, let's paint the structure of the organization. How many functions do we have on this leadership team? We've got 10 people in the room. You know, do we have a, a visionary in the room? Do you have an integrator? We have sales and marketing, operations, finance. Do we have an HR function that's on the leadership team? Do we have a technology function? And, you know, you kind of see the room and everybody looking at each other and saying, OK, well, something's about to occur here. And, you know, we had a breakthrough. We 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 it took some time, uh, about six hours of conversation. But the, they stepped up and said, here's what the structure looks like. And I said, this is a structure that is going to get us to where we want to go. Now let's put names in boxes. So, of course, that's where the things start coming up of like who's in their unique ability, who's the right person in the right seat to take you know, the finance seat or the sales and marketing seat. And ultimately, Jeremy, what happened is there was a lot of emotion. There was breakthroughs. By the end of the day, there was hugs. There was a little animosity that took a couple more meetings to get through for certain folks. But as I reflect on it today, which has been now like three years, everyone in that family is happy. Everyone on that leadership team is happy. The, the four folks who are non-family are like, thank you, because now we can actually scale this business in a healthy way and we've got everybody operating in their unique ability. So, you know, more than just a, a business case study, I think it's uh, the beauty of family, right? Families first and allowing that family to prosper through the system was just a gift to see. 
Kevin, what happens when you're working through the accountability chart and then someone is either not on that accountability chart, there's maybe not a place for them, or they're not, there's a disagreement. Like, no, I should be in that whatever visionary role and you have me in this other role. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and I would say majority of the time you have something like that occur where there's folks in the room and there isn't a seat for them, right? Or there's someone who believes they're great at operations, but they really suck. And now is an opportunity to talk about it, right? But they're great at something else. And the thought there is, is that we operate in the greater good of the organization, right? So what is the greater good of the organization? It's not about any one of us. It's about the totality of the team, right? Creating this oneness mindset that we have around how do we elevate one another together. And of course, uh, it's difficult, but we enter the danger. It's like, hey, we got to have this conversation because it's clear that we are exhausting more human energy than conserving it because we haven't had these conversations. And that's where we say we enter the danger, right? We have the conversation and not always easy, but we give a safe environment for people to speak openly and freely and talk about the why, right? Why do you feel that I'm not the right person? Or why do you think this person is? Let's talk about the unique abilities and let's bring out the best in one another. And ultimately, what I've seen in my experiences is that someone is suffering, not just the organization, because they're trying to do the things they're not great at. And we allow them the opportunity to recognize that and take responsibility for what they are great at and put them in that seat, regardless of where it is on the accountability chart. You mentioned, you know, a lot of times these friction points lead to breakthroughs. Right. Um, when when you took your your business and your your family through EOS, where did you find what was an example of a friction point that led to a breakthrough? Like initially when you're going through that, it's like, this is going to be not a pleasant conversation. Like yeah. when I picture someone's like, I'm not on the accountability chart. That doesn't say, you say, uh, you know, there was some animosity. I'm sure you're putting it lightly in some cases, but what was one of those friction points when you were implementing EOS, but that led to something better and greater? Yeah. So I think, I think number one, it's important to state, right. Being a, a a uh, first generation Indian, right? I'm Indian. There's a cultural thing about uh, age and you know uh, seniority and authority. I'd say in, in in my family business, I'm the youngest of my two brothers in the business, right? But I was the natural leader, and I I've always been the natural leader. But again, taking back the cultural aspects of our family and our dynamics, there's a big part of status that comes up, right? So. It was uh, actually pretty complex when we went through it. And what the breakthrough there was is that this is about accountability. It's not about ego and titles, right? So call whoever you want, right? You can call me the CEO if you like. That's great. But what am I accountable for in this business, right? To my brothers, I said the same thing. Titles are whatever we have for the external world, which is very important. But what we work on and what we talk about is accountability when we talk about the accountability chart. What is actually going to allow you to thrive, right, in what you bring in the business? And our big breakthrough there was just we got in our lanes, right? We got in our lanes. We built our teams. And there was no more end runs where, say, I would go around someone on a leadership team and talk to a direct report or vice versa. And allowing ourselves to have the right lanes in our business allowed us to just kind of flourish in what our unique abilities were, but not an easy thing, right? Because as humans, we all have ego and that's a reality of it. And ego comes into the room in different ways. You know, Mark Winters talks in Rockefeller about the visionaries and integrators and, you know, that the visionaries, you know, in the entrepreneur world, the visionaries are more common, right? Uh, like you're a visionary. When you um, implemented EOS in your business, was there a natural integrator there or did you have to bring on someone um, either internal or from the outside? Yeah, there was. Um, it's interesting. We use a profiling tool called the Culture Index, which actually Samit, uh, shout out to him. He's a sponsor of EO Chicago as well. Um, we use that tool for just trying to naturally understand how people are wired. And there's two typified patterns that make for the greatest integrators. They're called the technical expert and the architect, and they're just naturally wired to be great integrators. They're 
high fact finders, process people, they're fast paced, they're self starters with high follow through. None of us on our team were close to that, right? Like we were, my other brother had a visionary profile. I have a visionary profile. My other brother's like an operator who just needs direction and he's great once he gets it. And a couple other folks on our leadership team are similar. Um, bringing that data to the conversation, Jeremy, was great, right? Because it was it was allowed us to cut through the emotion. So we actually used that profile. And I'll give another shout out to my mentor, my YPO mentor, Steve Perlman. He actually brought that tool to me in 2015. And Steve was like, hey, you guys need to use this tool. If you're not going to do it, I'm going to pay for it. And I was like, all right, I need to do this because that's how much he believes in it. And that allowed us to bring a ton of data into the conversation where we were able to say, well, this isn't really a discussion. We know like where we need to sit because of the profiles also. So that allowed us to bring somebody from, you know, within the organization up to sit in that box over time. One thing, thanks for sharing that. One thing I want to talk about is you also helped an 18 partner organization. And I want to hear you walk through that a little bit, because if you could navigate that, I'm, I'm sure you could navigate just about anything. Because some people may think, well, I have a five person leadership team or three partners. It's going to be, it's too complex to unpack this. Yeah. How did you navigate an 18 partner organization? Yeah, you know, it was difficult. Number one, it took a little bit of time and a, and a little bit of grace uh, that was needed for everyone. Uh, but what we found was that there's the ownership mindset, which is important. You know, 18 partners, they're all stakeholders, they're owners of the business, and we have to respect the ownership mindset. But we also have to understand that the leadership team is about executing the business plan, working together, being great leaders and managers. Right. And in that conversation, it was really where there had to be a breakthrough where it was like, hey, we're not uh, taking anyone out of the owner's box. We're not saying that 18 of you, none of you guys are still owners. You're going to continue to be owners. But do you want to do the technical work in this practice or do you want to lead and manage people? Right. How many of you love to be a coach? Let's talk about examples, how great of a coach you are. Right. Let's talk about the resume of how you're a great coach and why you should be considered for the position. And then let's talk about the EQ, the emotional intelligence you bring in to people when you manage them and how you manage them and how do you lift them. And it's interesting then in that dialogue where we will break through that, hey, owners, you're still an owner, but are you really a coach and a leader and a manager to these folks? It, it was able to open up the conversation to people saying, hey, I just want to sit in my lane because I love doing the technical work of the job and I don't actually want to do all of this stuff. And that took a little bit of time and energy, but what we found in there is that it allowed those 18 partners to really get in their lane and still have a voice, right? So one of the things we've done in that organization is before we do an EOS offsite session, we take a separate two-hour session and where we get all the information from the 18 partners of what's on their mind, right? What's working in the business? What's not working in the business? What do you think our biggest strategic goal should be the next 90 days? What are the biggest issues you see in the business? And that gave them the voice. And I think that was actually the secret sauce for us in creating a framework and a methodology that allowed them to have a voice in the room without actually having to be the leaders and managers of the organization. It sounds like, you know, Kevin, a lot of times you're helping people get working on their unique ability. So that they're happier, but also it drives the organization forward quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And in in you know, thinking about the unique ability is I'll go back to this thought that I've shared earlier, which is about EOS is a system to manage human energy. So if you think about it, it's no different than if I have to do chores around the house, which I really hate and suck at. That I'm usually procrastinating on that stuff, right? And I always tell people that's your bottom right quadrant, the stuff you don't like to do and you're not good at, call it the hate and suck bucket. It's the stuff that we procrastinate on. It's still on our mind. We've got to get it done. It's on that to-do list, but it's not getting done. It's exhausting us, right? So how do we flip that on and put our people, all of them in the stuff that they love to do and they're great at? Because that's when you're maximizing human potential in organizations. I mean, if we could just sit back and imagine you've got 10 people in your organization, right? How about if all 10 of them were in the upper two quadrants, which is the stuff they love to do and they're great at and they like to do and they're good at. And the way that uh, technology is advanced and the ability to communicate you know, globally so quickly, you can outsource so many things nowadays, right? 
you can you can outsource some of that stuff in the bottom two quadrants to other folks who will do it systematically and let our people really shine uh, in our business. So just talk really quickly, um, break down the buckets again. So how yeah. people should be thinking about managing human energy. Yeah, and in, in EOS, uh, for those who are self-implementing or, or reading the books, it's called the Delegate and Elevate tool. And the Delegate and Elevate tool has four quadrants, if you think about it. Uh, you know, the top right, left quadrant is the stuff that you love to do and you're great at. The top right is stuff you like to do and you're good at. The bottom left is stuff that you're good at, but you don't like to do, right? You're smart. You're good at it. You just don't like to do it. And the bottom right is the stuff you don't like and you're not good at, right? So the thought is, how do we delegate the things in the bottom two quadrants so we can elevate to the upper two quadrants, right? And I was, actually, it's interesting. I was with a client uh, yesterday, uh, an agency here in Chicago, and we were talking about capacity and they're talking about not having capacity, not having time. So I said, hey, let's do this is, is, is take a notebook. And this is actually my former mate, Dan Hyrich, shout out to him, because he taught me this technique through the Delegate and Elevate tool, is use a notebook for seven days, keep it with you. And anytime you're doing a task for something in the business, just put a bullet, write down what you did and how much time. And at the end of the day, clean that up, package it, com you know, combine things as they need to, but put the time of what it took for all those items. Do that over seven days. And then after seven days, get your favorite glass of wine or scotch or coffee or tea, whatever it is that you like to enjoy in your, in your private time. And now package those things in the four quadrants and see where the things are sitting in. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, the stuff you hear from people after they actually do that, right? And fascinating to see how teams then can bring that data together and actually then go through the exercise of, hey, it's interesting, a client again yesterday was like, we, there's certain things that we don't even know some of our folks are doing. And we're, as you're talking about, we're starting to list those things, right? So what can we just kill and stop doing? What can we outsource that are in those bottom two quadrants, right? What can we delegate in those bottom two quadrants? And then what can we automate, right? There's tons of stuff that just comes out of that exercise and that tool. That's fascinating. Love it. Kevin, I have one last question. First of all, just thanks for sharing your expertise, knowledge uh, with everyone. I want to encourage people, they can go to eosworldwide.com slash Kevin-Hundal, H-U-N-D-A-L. Are there any other places online we should point people to learn more? Uh, I think that'd be a great start. That's the microsite that has all my information on it. Um, you know, I have a help first mindset. So for anyone listening, even if you're a two-person team, have you got a question or you're a 200 person team and have a question. Um, I'm a help first person. As I mentioned, I'd love to help answer any questions anybody has. Awesome. Um, so check that out. There's an easy contact button there uh, to get in touch. My last question, Kevin, is mentors. I know, you know, we rise on the backs of, of giants and people. I'd love to hear some of your mentors. You mentioned a few already and, and maybe just one thing you learn from them. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I've had uh, several mentors through my entrepreneurial journey and all brought a different type of mindset, I think, to the relationship. One being an accelerator when I joined uh, John Fairclaw. Shout out to John. He owns Resicom. Great, uh, amazing entrepreneur, has a great story of how he built his organization, kind of built it from nothing. And, you know, he had a mindset of just being uh, creative in everything you did, right? Just be look at the creativity behind the decision. He taught me how to actually bring the words onto paper in a way that made sense to everyone in my organization. And he taught me that skill of how do you communicate effectively through visually showing people things. And that was just, for me, it was great at, at that age, um, you know, in 2007, when I was just starting my, my journey in entrepreneurship. And the other is Steve Perlman, who's my YPO mentor. You know, EO has this YPO EO mentor mentee relationship. And with Steve, it's uh, it's hard. Uh, it's hard. It's he just opens up his heart and has taught me how you bring love into the work that you do in your business, in your journey, and your personal life, and how having an open heart creates doors and opportunities. Right? I think no differently than today, Jeremy. If we go back to our mutual friend Tom. That's a, uh, a relationship that's based on, you know, a lot of heart and emotion and love for one another. And uh, talking to him opened up the door for me to see you, right? So Steve Perlman just taught me 
the uh, impact uh, you can have by just having an open heart on things and receiving things. Amazing. Everyone check out uh, eosworldwide.com slash Kevin dash Hundle. And Kevin, I want to be the first one to thank you. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.